Welcome everyone who uh, decided to uh, join us today. Uh, we're having a special uh, spooky Halloween edition of the uh, uh, Palisade monthly webinar. Uh, for those of you that are observant, I uh, hope you're wearing uh, scary costumes. Um, so we are today going to be um, uh, continuing our webinar series. Uh, we got uh, some quite a bit of extensive interest after the last uh, webinar about the support for multi-party and, and threshold oriented approaches for homomorphic encryption. So we decided to jump the uh, queue of episodes a little bit and uh, Yuri was able to put together a, a nice set of slides about how we support multi-party and threshold uh, homomorphic encryption in the open source Palisade. Um, so this is gonna be a little bit more for focused talk today, but uh, like I said, I, I see a number of people that are on the attendee list who had particularly asked for this. So you know, thank you for joining. and. Uh, Always happy to be responsive to uh, requests from our user community. Um, so without further ado, uh, Yuri, can you please uh, take it away and uh, share what we have to say? Sure, thank you, Kurt. Uh, so uh, just a quick intro, um, I'm Yuri Polikov, principal scientist with Duality and one, oh, and one of the developers, core developers of Palisade since the very beginning. So today we're going to talk about multi-party homomorphic encryption. And the agenda for today uh, includes, uh, basically we'll cover the basics of multi-party homomorphic encryption. Uh, we're going to discuss why multi-party homomorphic encryption is needed, in which cases. And we're going to discuss two main approaches for a multi-party homomorphic encryption, multi-key uh, approach and threshold approach. Then uh, we're going to discuss in more detail uh, the threshold approach, which is the one that's implemented in Palisade and we'll go over the key facts of basically how it works. And we'll go through the uh, uh, specialized op, uh, procedures in that protocol, uh, uh, one for distributed key generation, another for distributed decryption. And uh, at the end of this uh, uh, presentation, we'll, have, uh, we'll go through a sample code that's included uh, in uh, the library, in the open source Palisade, and uh, we'll go step by step and I will explain uh, how uh, threshold FAQ can be used in Palisade. So the first uh, chapter of this talk is uh, covers the basics of multi-party homomorphic encryption, and um, uh, we're going to discuss the motivation and the key approaches. Uh, so let's look at the very simple uh, uh, single key homomorphic encryption workflow. I mean, something the classical setup with just like Alice and Bob, for instance, just two parties. Uh, and in this case, it's just a case of symmetric key encryption. And uh, as we know, and from previous talks and, and just in general, uh, that uh, in this case, uh, there is one key involved. So there is a secret key that uh, data owner has. So in this particular case, we're talking about computation that involves a data owner and also a computation host that uh, has access to a certain proprietary model. So uh, the only key that's used in this case uh, is the secret key that the data owner has. So the data owner uh, encrypts the data with this key, so using symmetric key encryption, sends the results to the computation host. Uh, the computation host applies a certain model, proprietary model that uh, that host has access to in the clear, and then sends back uh, the encrypted result to the data owner so that the data owner can decrypt it. So very simple workflow. But what if we want to expand this, uh, I would say to more realistic scenarios, very often to uh, scenarios that we hear about in practice. So one of such extension would be related to supporting multiple data owners. Let's say that we need to support multiple data owners and uh, obviously for security reasons, they don't want to share uh, the same key. They don't want to disclose uh, they do not want to provide a mechanism for someone to basically decrypt their data. Um, uh, so that's one interesting use case where we're going to need uh, a multi-party uh, homomorphic encryption. And then the second uh, possible extension that we can look at is, uh, let's say the model that uh, the computation host works with needs to be encrypted and needs to be provided by someone else. And the computation host just does the, uh, is a powerful host that can do the computation itself. And uh, if the uh, model provider, uh, model owner uh, needs to encrypt uh, the model, what key is the model provider going to use? And it's 
typically not a good idea to use uh, the same key for, uh, for security reasons. Uh, so uh, there are two ways to solve this problem conceptually. So one uh, approach is uh, called multi-key homomorphic encryption. And the other approach is uh, called threshold homomorphic encryption. And uh, we're going to go through each of those two use cases. First, uh, from the perspective of the multi-key approach, and then uh, we're going to look at it from the perspective of a threshold uh, homomorphic encryption uh, approach, uh, highlighting the differences. So, of course, the full workflow is quite complex, and, and in this case, we don't want to show uh, uh, all uh, the traffic that's involved in key generation, in sending encrypted data, decrypted data, and uh, so on, we're going to focus only on the differences, just to highlight the differences between the multi-key approach and the threshold key approach. So in this case, so we're looking first at the scenario of multiple data owners. Um, and uh, each data owner in the case of multi-key uh, homomorphic encryption will have its own secret key. So secret key one, secret key two, secret key three. So there are different keys. And uh, each of these uh, data owners will generate evaluation keys that can be used for public evaluation, such as multiplication or rotation operations from their individual keys. So they're going to send uh, evaluation keys for their secret keys, and the computation host knows how to apply those uh, specialized evaluation keys uh, to perform the computation. So then uh, uh, what's important to note that each data owner will encrypt the data using their own secret key. So uh, uh, in other words, they, uh, this, there will be three different data flows, all of them coming with uh, encrypted under a different key. And uh, so uh, once the data is sent over to the computation host, computation uh, host applies certain transformations uh, so that the computation can be performed uh, working with the evaluation keys and encrypted data for different keys. And when the result is obtained, there is a protocol uh, to perform a de a collective decryption. And so de de distributed decryption where each data owner will uh, compute its partial decryption and they will be combined. So just I'll, I'll make a quick note right now that the decryption protocol, the distributed decryption protocol is basically the same in both multi-key and threshold homomorphic encryption. It's the first step that will be different. So this is how one would extend the simple single key homomorphic encryption model to multi-key to multi-key scenario with multiple data owners. So now let's look at uh, the other potential use case where uh, we would want to have multiple keys and we would want to use multi-party homomorphic encryption. The scenario when uh, the we have one data owner. Uh, we, that encrypted the data, but we also have uh, a model owner that encrypts the data and sends it over to the computation host. In other, in other words, the computation host in this case does not have access to the model. It does not have access to the data. I mean, in the clear, it only can work with encrypted model and the encrypted data. And uh, the uh, logic in which multi-key FHE would be applied in this case is very similar to the first case. So. Uh, first, uh, evaluation keys generated to uh, each, uh, uh, evaluation keys need to be generated for each secret key, for secret key one, secret key two. They're sent uh, to the computation host. Uh, then uh, the uh, data owner and model owner encrypt the, uh, the data and the model respectively with their own keys and send it to the computation host. And then the computation host performs the computation kind of similar transformations and uh, sends the results back. And uh, the uh, uh, data owner and model owner collectively through a distributed decryption process uh, uh, get the results. So if we were to use uh, threshold uh, homomorphic in encryption for this case, then there would be some changes primarily related to the stage of key generation and uh, the fact which keys is used to do the actual uh, um, encryption. So in this case, in the scenario of threshold uh, homomorphic encryption, we can, can conceptually think that uh, for the 
that let's say we'll look first at the scenario of three data owners, that each data owner has a secret key share. So it's uh, uh, so it, essentially it's going to be a secret key sharing protocol. So data owner one has part of the, of the full secret key, data owner two has another secret share and data owner three has third secret share. And then these data owners will interact at the stage of key generation to compute a joint public key that will be used later to perform the actual encryption of data. Uh, and uh, so there is a special protocol, some rounds of communication interactions that take place between the data owners to essentially homomorphically compute uh, uh, the public key, to homomorphically compute the evaluation keys that will be needed. And all further uh, 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 interactions after this, so I mean, uh, all further operations such as the encryption of data uh, will be done using this uh, joint public key. So each data owner will encrypt the data using this same, uh, uh, or I would say uh, uh, using a public key that basically is derived uh, from uh, the sum of these secret shares. I, I want to uh, highlight that this uh, underlying full secret key that is the sum of the secret shares is never exposed to anyone, it's never in the clear. Um, we'll only work with an encrypted image of it, no matter what we do. So once the uh, keys are generated, the data is encrypted using the uh, uh, joint public key. It gets sent to the computation host and the computation host uh, operates in a way very similar or actually exactly the same as in the case of single key FHE. So there is one key involved essentially uh, and there are evaluation keys for that single key uh, and uh, the host performs all the computations uh, and then sends the result back. And uh, to get uh, the decrypted result, uh, the data owners have to go through uh, the same uh, distributed decryption uh, procedure as we discussed in the multi-key homomorphic encryption case. Uh, and uh, uh, they would basically have to talk to each other and, and uh, generate partial decryptions and then add them up to get the result. Uh, so, uh, so the main difference as we can see is in the way uh, key generation works and what key is used to encrypt the data. So if we apply this uh, with the threshold FHE approach to the other scenario where we have uh, uh, encrypted uh, uh, data, so for, for, uh, for data owner and encrypted model, so that's, uh, um, uh, we also have two secret key shares, secret key share one and secret key share uh, uh, two and both parties interact with each other. So these arrows indicate this uh, key generation process to compute the joint public key. Then uh, they also compute uh, any evaluation key such as for multiplication or rotation. And uh, afterwards they use the same uh, joint public key to do the encryption of both data and uh, the model. And uh, the computation host has basically essentially in this case uh, is not uh, trusted in a way. I mean, it doesn't have access to any keys um, or in it to any data and just performs the homomorphic computation. Uh, and uh, in, in all other aspects, this uh, uh, the procedure is similar to the case of multiple data owners. You can think of it as just uh, one of the data owners being uh, substituted with the model owner. And uh, so obviously the uh, main question uh, that one has in practice, what do we want to use, and which? Uh, what are the pros and cons of uh, each of these uh, two approaches? And uh, uh, why, for instance, in uh, Palisade we decided to choose the threshold uh, homomorphic encryption approach? Um, so the first uh, difference uh, is related to the to the procedure of key generation, and uh, we already saw from the. Uh, uh, flow diagrams previously that in the case of uh, uh, multi-key holomorphic encryption, the procedure essentially is non-interactive. So the key generation does not uh, 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 involve any interactions between the parties. Each of them work with their own secret key and they generate evaluation keys for those key for their own keys and send them to the uh, computation host. In the case of threshold FHE, it's an interactive procedure. It's a synchronous procedure. So all parties have to be online and uh, go through the 
basically a couple of rounds uh, to compute uh, the uh, uh, all the public keys or evaluation keys for the uh, basically joint the joint public key and, uh, um, and the joint evaluation keys. So then the second difference in terms of functionality is related to uh, the number of parties, whether the number of parties is fixed or it's variable. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the multi-key approach is dynamic and has a benefit that uh, parties can basically join and uh, leave and uh, it can support a variable number of parties. And uh, the only constraint is set uh, only on the number of parties that are involved in a specific computation. So there is a certain flexibility that uh, the multi-key approach has. Uh, the threshold approach typically assumes uh, that uh, the number of parties is fixed, because otherwise the procedure of uh, key generation has to be uh, re basically repeated. So uh, the typical setting is when the number of parties is fixed. Uh, as far as the decryption is concerned, we already saw this. Uh, exactly the same procedure uh, is used in both cases. Partial decryptions are uh, computed uh, uh, in a secure way, then they're added up uh, to get the result. So uh, this uh, distributed key gener uh, distributed decryption uh, is done the same way in both cases. Uh, so now the main differences uh, further on are related to the com complexity of computations. While uh, the multi-key approach has certain benefits such as uh, supporting a non-interactive uh, key generation and uh, dynamic uh, number of parties, the computation runtime of uh, the actual homomorphic computations grows uh, asymptotic. I mean, in an asymptotic, uh, if we look asymptotically, it grows quadratically with the number of parties. So that's a uh, very significant degradation in speed. And the results that we're going, we're presenting here are the state of the art results uh, for multi-key FHE that are published in CCS19. Uh, so uh, there is a significant cost in runtime. So the computation runtime uh, grows quadratically. So if you, let's say you have uh, basically uh, 10 parties and you, you, you're, you're gonna be getting close to 100 uh, basically X uh, Re, uh, reduction in runtime. In practice, it's slightly less. So, uh, so it's uh, asymptotic versus practical. Uh, it's, I mean, there is a, a little bit of difference, but uh, not very substantial. Um, and uh, the advantage of the threshold FHE from this per perspective is that it has the roughly the same runtime as in the case of single key FHE. So uh, essentially, since you're working with a joint key, you're doing the same computations as if you're working with a single key. Uh, the main difference in, is that uh, no one has access to the single key and everyone just has access to a share. So there is a major uh, difference in the computation runtime uh, between the two scenarios. I would say even dramatic difference. And then the other uh, part that should be taken into account is the size of uh, evaluation keys uh, and uh, ciphertexts that are involved in this case. Uh, and uh, in the multi-key model, there is a linear dependency on the number of parties. Again, uh, uh, everything in the threshold FHE case still operates uh, in a essentially single key model. So uh, there is, a, I would say, a dramatic difference in performance between multi-key and threshold FHE approach. And um, in many scenarios that uh, uh, where uh, homomorphic encryption is currently considered, uh, uh, it's very uh, reasonable to assume that the number of parties is fixed and rel I mean, uh, and um, um, for instance, the data owners are fixed. I mean, if we're talking about uh, that type of setting rather than the dynamic client setting and uh, uh, considering the performance uh, differences between the two approaches, uh, uh, Palisade currently supports, uh, currently focuses on the threshold uh, homomorphic encryption approach. So uh, this concludes the first chapter of uh, uh, this presentation, and uh, we can take questions now. Hi, Yuri. Uh, there was one quick question about um, you know, communication complexity being linear in the number of data owners. Uh, short answer is what I said is that, uh, although I, I you know, 
just to clarify, the communication complexity for the threshold FHE approaches are linear with the number of parties. Um, I don't know off the top of my head for the multi-key FHE what the communication complexity is for the number of parties. Yeah. So I so I yeah. So I presented some. So maybe I'll go back to the previous slide. Uh, so uh, yeah. So it's clear that from the runtime perspective, there is a big difference in how it's computed. So there is an effect also on the ciphertext size, which obviously has uh, um, additional, um, uh, I mean, that can affect the parameters and so on. So uh, the fact that the ciphertext size is roughly linear in the number of parties that uh, I would say the communication costs are uh, going to be also, I mean, somewhat, I mean, quasi linear, I would say that's uh, uh, so close to that. It's the biggest, uh, limitation that um, uh, the multi-key approach has is related essentially to the computation runtime, how it scales. So that's, that's uh, the, there is nothing that can be done there. Uh, the computation complexity, I think is the difference is not as dramatic there. Great, thank you, Yuri. Um, I don't see any further questions at this time. Uh, for those of you who are attending, Please feel free to uh, send us questions either through the chat or through the Q&A window and uh, happy to, to address them as we go. Thanks, Yuri. So now we're going to talk about uh, threshold uh, homomorphic encryption in more detail uh, and um, explain essentially all the main ingredients that are involved. So first, maybe just to uh, summarize the key facts about threshold FHE. So all parties interact to generate a joint public key and evaluation keys using a share of their secret key held by each party. So that's a major uh, difference between uh, threshold approach and the multi-key approach. Uh, then very important to uh, note that although there is a, a full secret key, which is a sum of uh, um, uh, secret shares, in basically that's underlying secret key, uh, no one is ever, no party ever sees it. So uh, this uh, full secret key is never really revealed to any party. And the actual keys are computed in a homomorphic manner uh, from the individual secret shares. So this joint public key is then used to perform encrypted computations using the same, basically exactly the same way as things are done in a single key FHE. So uh, one uh, conceptual benefit of, the, I mean, one major benefit of this approach is whatever we do with the multi-party setting does not affect or almost does not affect uh, the uh, way the actual computation is performed and uh, the uh, runtime of the computation complexity of computation. I mean, there is a small effect of course, uh, but uh, uh, in uh, conceptually, it's the same process that's done as in the case of uh, a single key FHE. Uh, and uh, so, uh, of course, there are differences in the way key generation are done and decryption. So the decryption requires an interactive procedure where all parties should collaborate uh, to get partial decryptions and, uh, and basically add them up and essentially fuse them or merge them together. So this is uh, uh, one part that is different between uh, threshold FHE and single key FHE. And, and uh, uh, as we saw previously, it equally applies to multi-key FHE. And uh, just a note, so this particular functionality is currently supported uh, for three schemes in Palisade, so uh, BGV, BFD, and CPK. So the schemes that uh, uh, work with uh, packed ciphertext. So now we're going to discuss in more detail each of the uh, procedures, uh, also trying to understand the communication complexity and how many rounds are needed uh, uh, so, uh, to address some of the, I mean, maybe to give more information related to the question that was asked earlier. So uh, how does the public key generation work? So we just want to generate a public key that will be used for encryption. So the first party generates a secret key, uh, share SK1 and and certain public share PK1 from it. So the PK1 public share is similar, is generated in a manner similar to normal public key. And a certain 
auxiliary uh, piece of information, in this case, uniform ring, uh, uniformly uh, random ring element or polynomial uh, uh, is used to, in generating this PK1. So there is a common uh, uh, polynomial A that uh, we have here that will be used by both parties. Then a party, the second party does the same thing, but for their secret uh, share. And they generate their basically uh, public share PK2 from it. And uh, uh, then we're going to use the additive property of homomorphic encryption to add up this uh, public share uh, to get essentially joint public key that corresponds to the sum of the secret shares. Um, and uh, in this case, our uh, joint public key is going to be, uh, is going to have two parts. The first one, uh, or you can think of two polynomials. The first one is uh, this uh, auxiliary polynomial A that's basically used, uh, uh, it's, you can think of it as a, a certain public parameter, and then the sum of public uh, shares. And this uh, particular joint public key corresponds to of the secret key, full secret key, that is the sum of the secret shares. Again, we want to highlight that uh, the secret key is never available in the clear for any party. And uh, trying to address the complexity, so obviously we looked at uh, two parties. Uh, if uh, we have M parties, then uh, we're going to have M minus one rounds of communication. Uh, uh, if we just use the classical approach of sequential topology, all parties just uh, in sequence uh, interact with each other. Of course, if there uh, something like hub topology or something more advanced is used, then uh, the number of rounds can be uh, 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 reduced. So now we're going to look at the uh, generation of rotation keys. So uh, in uh, homomorphic encryption, we have two types of evaluation keys that are used in computations. Uh, uh, the first type, I, I mean, they're sometimes called automorphism keys, uh, Galois keys, uh, 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 but conceptually, they, you can think of them as certain rotation keys. And, uh, and we're going to go to the procedure of uh, generating these rotation keys uh, next. And then the other key that we used uh, is, uh, uh, so we call it here multiplication evaluation key, but often it's uh, uh, referred to as a randomization key that's used in multiplication. And the procedures for key generation and the number of rounds needed are different between the rotation keys and multiplication keys. So uh, in this case, uh, for the rotation uh, key scenario, uh, our goal is to compute an evaluation key that switches from a rotation of uh, this joint uh, secret key uh, back to the original key. That's our goal and that's the operation that we want to support and which basically uh, should uh, mimic the uh, same type of operation that we have in the case of a single key of HG. How is that done? So party one generates a rotation key share uh, with A, B1. So A in this case is, is a matrix of uh, polynomials. So very similar to the uh, lower case A previously, but we have a vector of those now. And uh, B1 is a certain uh, uh, encryption essentially uh, that is very similar to how uh, rotation key generation is done in single key of HG. So uh, that part is generated from uh, uh, for the desired rotation of a uh, secret key. The same thing is done by party two and uh, uh, essentially two vectors of uh, polynomials are generated A and B2. So, uh, and uh, uh, in the case of uh, rotation keys, uh, uh, all we're just since we're dealing with automorphism, just a certain uh, 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 transform operation and the transform operation there. All we need to do is just add up those uh, shares. So add up the essentially matrices that we're dealing with there uh, to get the joint rotation key. So uh, in this case, again, we use the additive uh, 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 homomorphic property to add up uh, the rotation key shares to get the joint rotation key. And uh, again, just we want to highlight that the secret key is never available in the clear. So the complexity of this uh, uh, is clearly the same as in the case of public key generation. All we need to do is just to add up uh, two shares. Uh, and uh, for M parties, we would need 
n minus one rounds of communication uh, to achieve that. So the most complex uh, key generation procedure that we're going to look at is the multiplication one. And uh, the reason why the multiplication procedure is, uh, requires more rounds is because our goal is in this case is to compute an evaluation key that switches from square of the joint key back to the original key. I mean, in other words, you can think of it as an encryption of the square of a joint key under base, uh, the original key. And uh, before we go into each step in detail, the high level thought here is that we perform additions and multiplication. So homomorphically we add, then we multiply, then we add again to uh, basically get it to a quadratic function. That's the idea. So, uh, the, and uh, we need to have separate rounds for that. So party uh, one, uh, in the first round, so we're going to use three rounds to illustrate this process for two parties. Um, multiplication key share, A, B, one is generated for secret key one. So again, you can think of this as almost equivalent to what we did for the rotation key. So uh, there is a common matrix of uh, uniform uh, uh, random ring elements, polynomials, and then there is a certain B1 part that is computed the same way that uh, 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 multiplication evaluation keys are computed for single key parties. And uh, so then this party one uh, sends the result of uh, uh, this, uh, I mean, it sends the share to basically uh, party uh, two. Then at round two, uh, uh, party two now generates the same type of key share. So a, B2, so, but from their own secret key two, from their own secret key share, uh, from the second secret key share. And uh, then this second party combines the multiplication shares by adding them up. So very similar to what we did for the rotation key. So the protocol is essentially the same up to this point as we uh, considered for uh, rotation key generation and uh, public key generation. It's simple addition. But we're going to need to do something more complex. We need to get to a quadratic function. So th then uh, this uh, second party uses a and, uh, this uh, uh, a and B, so basically this uh, matrix, um, um, to compute a multiplication share. So in other words, here we're introducing the operation uh, of homomorphic multiplication uh, to uh, get uh, a share, to get a certain intermediate evaluation key that corresponds to, uh, to the secret uh, key share two multiplied by the sum of uh, secret key share. So this is the, our uh, joint uh, uh, key. And uh, now we're multiplying one of the shares by the previous joint keys. And essentially it's our first step to computing the quadratic function of the joint key. And uh, then party two sends uh, uh, B and uh, basically C to D2, which is that uh, multi multiplication share corresponding to this product to party A. So in round three, now party one is going to use uh, uh, the uh, information that was provided uh, by party uh, one um, uh, to compute a similar multiplicative uh, uh, share. So multiplication share. So basically exactly the same way as it was done previously by party two, I mean, uh, party one uh, computes uh, uh, an intermediate evaluation key that corresponds to the product of uh, first secret key share by the joint uh, key. And uh, you can probably already guess what the next step is going to be. We're just going to add up those two uh, um, intermediate evaluation keys to get the quadratic function, to get the square of uh, SK1 plus SK2. So here we again use uh, uh, homomorphic um, addition uh, to join those parts and get the square of the joint key. So effectively, you can think of this uh, whole procedure as uh, uh, 
consisting of three uh, key homomorphic operations. First addition, then multiplication, and then addition that gives us um, as the result, the square of the sum of uh, uh, secret uh, keys. And uh, what's important in this scenario, we saw that in the case of two parties, we had to go through three rounds. So uh, because of the extra multiplication step involved. So this means that for M parties, uh, we will need to go through two multiplied by M minus one rounds if we just use the like uh, 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 naive sequential topology uh, to uh, compute this uh, joint evaluation keys that can be used in homomorphic multiplication. So now we're going to discuss uh, the other part. So uh, the key has been keys have been generated. The computation took place using the same protocol mechanism as is typically used in single key homomorphic encryption. And now we need to do the distributed decryption, which as we previously mentioned, requires collaboration between uh, different parties. So let's say we have a certain ciphertext C1, C2 as the input, so two polynomials. And uh, first party one computes what we call as lead partial decryption of C1, C2 using their secret key share and using both polynomials. So it's, uh, uh, so this first party does something slightly different than others. Oops. Uh, then uh, the second party uh, computes its partial decryption of C1, C2 using uh, its secret share, um, secret key two, and one of the two polynomials that uh, was uh, provided, C2. So each of them does basically partial, uh, computes partial decryptions in a certain secure manner. And then these partial descriptions are added up or merged or fused, whichever way, uh, uh, I mean, whichever term is uh, uh, you want to use to describe it to get the desired decryption result. And uh, it's uh, very clear that uh, again, we're dealing with a uh, simple addition operation essentially. So for M parties in the, uh, using the naive sequential topology, we would need m minus run um, m minus one rounds of communication, and this concludes uh, the discussion, uh, more detailed discussion of uh, threshold homomorphic encryptions, and uh, uh, can answer any questions that we have here. Yeah, hi Yuri. There was one question that came in, and I kind of lost track about what the question was specifically about. So maybe the um, person who asked could 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 repeat it. There's a question about who generates the polynomial A and how do you know it was generated at random? I think this is back during some of the key, key generation or encryption steps um, and using pseudonym or random number generator to kind of kick off the threshold process, I believe. Yeah, yeah, so this is, yeah, this is an important question. So this, so first of all, this polynomial A is a public parameter that's effectively going to be used by all parties. So uh, I want to basically mention that. So th there, there, there can be, uh, you know, different ways, I mean, depending on the model, I mean, depending on uh, how you would want to do it. I mean, one approach is the first party could um, generate the polynomial A uh, and uh, then send that polynomial over to the next party. Of course, in this case, there is a certain assumption of trust that this uh, uh, first party should have to make sure that they have a good uh, PRNG and they ha have a good mechanism to generate this. So that's that's probably the most uh, straightforward way. Uh, uh, also, this uh, uh, uniformly random element can be generated by another basically separate third party before any key generation starts and be published just to guarantee that it has uh, uh, basically certain, uh, you know, properties of, for instance, it, it's uh, uniformly random. So these are the two uh, approaches that can be used depending on the use case and depending on the level of trust. Um, um, I mean, uh, that uh, exists, I mean, the level of trust in terms of performing the protocol correctly uh, that exists in this case. Uh, so uh, both scenarios are possible, but this polynomial A is something that is just a public parameter uh, it's not, there is no uh, special uh, 
uh, I mean, uh, it doesn't need to be basically kept secret in any way. All right, thank you, Yuri. Um, are there any other questions or comments coming from the audience or anything else you want to add, Yuri? Uh, not really before we get into the example. Uh, yeah, why don't we dive into the example? We'll go from there. Okay, so now we're going to uh, go through the procedure of how do you actually implement something like this in Palisade. Uh, obviously, this case is more complex, more complicated than a single KFHU. And uh, uh, we, we're going to walk through an existing example that's published in the library. And, and uh, I'll provide a reference to this example at the very end of uh, uh, this uh, uh, chapter. Um, so uh, let's uh, start from the very beginning. So the everything, so at a very high level, what's done to create the context uh, and uh, set crypto context is exactly the same as what is done in the case of single key, except for enabling the multi-party uh, uh, feature capability. That's, that's the only difference uh, that we have, for instance, as compared to the previous example for uh, BFV uh, RNS that uh, we showed in the previous, um, um, in the previous uh, uh, webinar. So maybe I'll just very quickly, so we set the plain text modulus, which is something we need to do with BGV and BFV. Uh, there is a, a standard deviation that's you know, uh, used uh, common standard deviation. There is a security level. There is a multiplicative depth that we want to support. We set the uh, crypto context based on this, and then we turned on encryption, uh, somewhat homomorphic encryption capability, and the multi-party capability to uh, set the crypto context in all the parameters. Um, so now we're going to go through the process of key generation and just explain how those specific rounds are implemented in Palisade and which functions to call. Uh, so there, there are certain key pairs that will be used to keep one, keep two, keep multi-party. I mean, this I mean, we can kind of briefly ignore this step. It's just uh, to initialize certain variables. So the first round, so what we described as the first round of key generation. So, and this first round is we're going to use it uh, for uh, to generate a certain share of the public key, a certain share of the uh, multiplication key and a certain share of the rotation key. Uh, and note that in this case, we're looking at something that's not just a rotation key, but uh, a, a several rotation keys together that are used to perform the eval sum operation. Eval sum, basically adding up all the components in a vector that's packed. So eval sum in this case is a representation of rotation. So it's conceptually you can think of it as uh, many rotation keys. It, it's just something that's useful uh, for for instance, for inner, inner product operation. So first, in, in the first round, so we call key gen, just uh, to generate, which is looks as the same way as we generate the uh, secret and public key in the normal setting. Then we uh, generate the first uh, uh, part of the multiplication key using um, a special key switch gen function that's not typically used in the, in the normal setting. So this is exposed for the multi-party setting. And then we also uh, generate the uh, uh, normal eval sum, basically a bunch of rotation keys in a normal manner uh, for uh, the uh, first uh, secret key share for, I mean, in this case, we use party A and party B. Uh, um, and uh, what's also important just from the, this, from the technical perspective, since the um, so rotation keys or summation keys are typically stored inside the crypto context to simplify the API, in this case, we need to be able to extract them. And essentially this operation of uh, what uh, here tells us, okay, we generated something in, in the crypto context. I would like to get a shared pointer, I mean, basically a reference to that particular uh, uh, to those particular summation keys so we can use them in uh, uh, future key generation. So internally in Palisade, we use certain uh, hashes uh, that correspond to each secret key. And those hashes are used to map uh, 
uh, public keys or evaluation keys to uh, uh, a common secret key. So it's, you can think of this step as we took the first round or I mean the first step basically done for the first by the first party uh, for pu public key, uh, multiplication key and uh, rotation that is summation key. And um, it, um, this is how we implement it in policy. So now we're going to go through round two. So this is what's done by party B. So the first round was done by party A. Now we're going to party B. And uh, the idea of just, again, the very high level idea is we're going to add, we're going to compute sums of shares for the public key, for the rotation key or summation key, and for the multiplication keys. So, and, uh, um, and now we're going to go through the actual uh, Palisade calls to do this. So first uh, we uh, compute the joint public key using a special multi-party key gen operation. So that's a new operation that's only uh, available when the multi-party feature is uh, turned on. Then we have uh, uh, also a new feature, a new operation called multi-key switch gen that allows us uh, to, uh, well, I mean, in this case so far, we're generating the uh, eval uh, multiplication key share uh, for the key. I mean, this is similar to what we did for part A, but that, the next step, what I was referring to previously, is when we add up those two uh, multiplication shares, one for SA, another for SB, and uh, we uh, use, a, again, a new function called multi add eval keys. So essentially, uh, multi means the prefix that uh, it's multi-party, and then we're adding evaluation keys. Um, and uh, the idea is we're trying to get an intermediate evaluation key that is corresponds to the sum of secret keys. And also in this second round, party B can go further and compute uh, the intermediate evaluation key that corresponds to the product of the joint secret key by uh, its secret key share. So SB multiplied by SA plus SB. So for that particular operation, we introduce a new function, a new method called multi, uh, multi eval key. So you can think of it, you can see that there is a multi add eval keys, multi multi eval keys. So there are special new operations of, homo of key homomorphic addition and multiplication uh, that is applied to evaluation keys that we use in this case. And uh, so, so these steps that we, these three steps that we saw here were for the multiplication. Now we're switch. Uh, now we're going to the next step of uh, the eval sum, the, uh, which is a vector of rotation keys. First, we generate the uh, secret. Uh, I mean, the um, eval sum uh, share corresponding to a secret key for party B, just the same way as we did it previously for. Uh, at the um, other party for the um, for party A, and now we're going to add up those uh, essentially shares from party A and party B using uh, again a new method called multi add eval sum keys. So there is a special method that adds uh, vectors of rotation keys together, and uh, we and. Uh, Essentially, this is the method that we use in this case. And keep in mind that we're everywhere we're supplying the key tag because uh, we're making sure that the key tag corresponding to the joint key is used in performing all those operations. And that uh, so that it basically corresponds to certain uh, full secret key that does not, uh, I mean, is not revealed to anyone, but there is a tag that tells us that uh, they refer to the same uh, key. And so then there is also a procedure here to uh, insert this um, uh, uh, computed uh, eval sum key, or basically uh, that can be used for eval sum operations later into the crypto context so that we, when we do the normal eval sum operation crypto context, it will use internally this uh, particular uh, uh, summation. And the third round, uh, which is which only deals with the multiplication key because of this uh, quadratic uh, function that we need to compute, uh, as as we saw in the in the previous discussion, uh, deals with. So first, we need to uh, 
compute an intermediate uh, evaluation key for multiplication that corresponds to the SA multiplied by SA plus SB. Um, and the same thing that we did uh, in round two for uh, party B, now we're at party A. And then we it again apply the already familiar operation of uh, multi-add eval mount keys. We add up uh, the uh, previously complete, uh, computed uh, uh, multiplication shares for evaluation keys to get the uh, square, to get the evaluation key which, that allows us to switch from the square of joint key to uh, the original key. And then we have to insert this computed evaluation uh, multiplication key into the crypto context so that uh, it can be used for multiplications after this. So the, this particular uh, step, I mean, uh, so this, this uh, uh, I mean, that, that step concluded the key generation. Now we're going to the uh, operation of encryption. So uh, I will immediately say that encryption and computations are exactly the same and, uh, and done exactly the same way as they are uh, done in the case of single key FHE. So, uh, this, ex so this example looks very familiar. Uh, and uh, uh, to what we discussed uh, in the previous webinar. So we have a vector of uh, signed integers, which we just use uh, for this computation. Then we encode this vector of uh, signed integers into plain text, so not certain negative plain text, and then we can encrypt this uh, plain text. So we use this KP public key, essentially that's the representation. KP2 is in our case, is what we refer to as the joint key. And the computations themselves also are transparent to uh, the fact that we uh, did a very, I mean, a relatively um, uh, non-trivial uh, key generation, distributed key generation previously. All we're doing is we're adding up ciphertext um, here. We're doing multiplication as, and I mentioned previously, uh, since we do not expose uh, uh, the evaluation key for multiplication, uh, the, the realization key in the multiplication operation, it uses the one that's already loaded in the key, uh, key dependent part of the crypto context. And this is why we call that insert function previously. So we call eval mount, it multiplies uh, to ciphertext, and we also call eval sum operation that in this case uh, uh, adds up essentially all the results of uh, 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 in this, uh, in this case, ciphertext three. And uh, so 1024 just means the batch size. So if assumption here is that we work with a vector of uh, size uh, 1024, we could use a smaller number if we wanted uh, for this particular example, it's 16 would be sufficient, but this is just to illustrate the function. So everything that's here, the actual homomorphic operations are done exactly the same way as they were done in the single key FHE setting. What's different uh, is, uh, I mean, the, the, this, I would say the second part that's different uh, in addition to uh, the distributed key generation is uh, the distributed decryption. So now we have to go through this logic and uh, simply speaking, we have to compute the first partial uh, decryption. So using this multi-party decrypt lead. So that's something I referred to previously. So the first party does something slightly different than all the other parties. Then uh, party B in this case uh, uh, calls the multi-party decrypt main, which is a basically standard operation of computing a partial ciphertext. And if we had, let's say five parties here, then uh, uh, the first party would, would use multi-party decrypt lead. And then uh, four other parties would uh, use uh, the decrypt main operation. And so all this, uh, ciphertext, intermediate ciphertext can be put together in a vector. And then we can perform the operation of basically adding up all those partial decryptions together uh, and uh, in or merging or fusing them together in Palisade, we call this uh, uh, method multi-party decrypt fusion uh, that essentially uh, computes the, uh, the uh, decrypted result and the, the uh, basically end result um, and stores it in the uh, plain text multi-party new uh, variable in this case. Um, and um, so the source for this example 
and uh, was taken from uh, the threshold FHE uh, CPP file that's provided in the EPA module of Palisade under examples. Uh, there are actually examples there for other schemes as well, not just BFERMS. There is an example for BGV. There is an example also for CPPS there. Uh, so uh, more detailed information can be found there. And uh, that this concludes uh, 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 this particular talk. So, Kurt, any new questions? Yeah, thanks, Yuri. Um, so great presentation. There was one question that came in. Um, will the code and slides be available after the webinar ends? Uh, the short answer is that the code is available in the public open source repo. And then the uh, recording of this will also be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, okay, anything to add, Yuri? Yeah, no. and we all also uh, always post the slides uh, in uh, on the webinars page of uh, policycrypto.org. So the slides will be uploaded there as well. All right, I'm just typing this up. Great. Um, any more questions or comments from any of our attendees? And maybe I'll, I'll add to this, Kurt, uh, if there are any other Palisade related questions that uh, anyone wants to ask, uh, we're happy to answer those as well, not just uh, related to uh, multi-party homework encryption. Great, and I just typed up uh, the uh, question that was just asked, YouTube site. Okay, I think this is uh, a good wrap. Yuri, thank you very much for an informative uh, presentation. And uh, thank you for all our attendees who took the time. And uh, in terms for the future webinar, um, we're getting into the US holidays pretty soon, both in uh, Thanksgiving is gonna be late November and then Christmas is late December, Christmas Hanukkah, late December. Um, we are going to have one more webinar over November, December, notionally in early December uh, to weave it between the holidays. And, uh, but we'll be posting to the uh, website, uh, LinkedIn, uh, social media, and uh, sending out an email to the announcements list uh, once we schedule the, uh, the, both the date and the content of the next webinar episode.